In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'm glad to be back home, but as is always the case, when I go somewhere else and meet more people, you know how it is when you have children, right? You love each one, and you just increase your love, right? Your love doesn't decrease, it just increases. So now, my heart is also in Uganda, my heart is in Kenya, my heart is here, my heart is in the prison. I think wherever you go, your heart should be. You should leave some of your heart there. And uh, it was a blessed and a wonderful trip, and perhaps I'll be able to talk to you about it uh, in, in group or, or individually about certain aspects of it. I want to talk to you about healing today. That's the whole point of the incarnation. We need healing. There's something wrong with us. We have problems. We need our problems solved. We cannot solve our problems. We don't have the strength to do it, the intelligence to do it, the resources to do it. Even if we knew how to do it, we don't have the resources. But we don't have the resources or no, we don't know anything. We are lepers. Leprosy in the ancient days, in the scriptures, was a sign of uncleanness. In fact, they were called unclean. And there were certain things that they had to do. They couldn't go to the temple. They couldn't go even to the synagogue. People wouldn't even touch them. Can you imagine going through your life, nobody touching you because you are unclean? That was leprosy. Leprosy shows a death because leprosy is literally dying. It is the dying of your fingertips and your nose and your feet and other parts of your body that are extremities and sometimes even parts of your face and in extreme cases other parts of your body, even where the warmer parts of your body. It's called Hansen's disease. It's now controlled by antibiotics. But in ancient times there was zero cure for it. If you were a leper, then you were a leper for your life until it killed you, unless, of course, God healed you. And it did happen. Naaman the Syrian was cured of leprosy. It was not unknown for leprosy to be cured by God. But in general, it was a sentence of slow death, of dying. That's what we're doing when we sin. It's a slow death. Sometimes it's a little quicker as well. So leprosy is a sign in the scriptures that we should recognize in ourselves. That there's death operating in us. There shouldn't be any death in us at all. God made us to not be dead, to be alive. Adam and Eve were created completely alive. They weren't perfect, but they were able to be perfect. They had all the resources to be perfect, and they would grow in knowledge to be perfect. There was nothing impeding them whatsoever, and then they sinned. And the sin made it impossible for them to reach God on their own. They couldn't do it. This is why the God-man became incarnate. And of course, we're in the season now when we are preparing for the nativity of our Savior. And that nativity is for our healing because we are lepers, because we are paralytics, because we are mute, because we can't praise God as we should. Any of the, any of the problems that you see, any of the afflictions in the New Testament and the Old, these are our afflictions if you think of them in a spiritual way. It's very important to understand that you're a leper. Now, God touches you, though. There's a difference between leprosy in the old and leprosy in the new. Our leprosy can be cured. And God, indeed, touches us very closely. We're about to partake of his divine body and blood. That's very close touching. But we are still lepers, and we must think of ourselves as such. And I think one of the problems with people, as far as their healing, they don't think they're lepers. They think they're kind of okay. You know, there are really bad people out there. There are people who do all kinds of terrible things, adultery and murder and, and uh, all that stuff. We don't do that stuff. Or maybe we've done only a little bit of it and we've repented. But we don't really do that stuff. We think we're better than, than most. We're not better than most. We're lepers. God wants to heal us of our leprosy. So the first part to healing is to understand that you need healing. So these men know that, knew that they needed healing. Of course, it was every day that they were aware of it. Nobody would talk to them or barely talk to them. Nobody would touch them. If they did touch them incidentally, then they had to go and be, had to go through this ritual uh, washings. No doubt that people considered that they were judged by God because of their le leprosy, that they were sinners in some terrible way. They were cut off from their people. 
So they realized they were sick. And they cried out. Of course, they cried out like the Jesus prayer, right? Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And they cried out, and the Lord heard them. And he partially healed them. This is important. Healing is a process. Healing is not a one-time event. Healing is a process. And there are multiple healings that occur in a given healing. So the first healing was that they were healed of their leprosy. The leprosy, the whiteness of their skin and the, and the degradation of their skin, their skin grew back perfect and pink and holy and, and whole. That was their first healing. And they were told to go to the priests and to do the prerequisite things that had to be done. That's described in the scriptures. It's very complicated, by the way. I, I read it and I never understand it. It's a lot of stuff, a lot of symbolism to it. But they, were, they had to do multiple things in order to be recognized and be re, no longer be uh, ostracized by their people and become part of the community again. And as they were going then, one of the men, seeing that he was healed, came back to worship God came back to make obeisance to Jesus Christ, came back to thank him. And Jesus said, were there not ten cleaned or cleansed? Where are the nine? The one who came was a Samaritan. He wasn't even of the Jewish race. He was basically, if you want to put it in a crude way, a heretic among the Jews who had some Jewish background and such, but they were people who had uh, intermingled with the graven things of Canaan, and had sort of a hybrid religion in many ways, and rejected certain things that were canonical Jewish scripture, etc. And the Jews hated them. They treated them like dogs. This man came back and gave thanks to God, and he received the second healing. Now, in this, in this story, it all happens at once. There's one healing, they go towards the priest, he peels off, comes back, and Christ says, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And now he's healed. But that's for the purposes of illustration here. That's not how it happens in life. It happens stepwise in life. You're healed in a process. And your reaction to your healing determines how much more healing you will have. God doesn't just bequeath things on you with a wand without your participation and without your active uh, involvement and reaction to his grace. Because healing is a relationship. Now perhaps grammatically that doesn't make sense. Healing is a relationship. You wouldn't get a good mark on your paper if that's how you defined healing. But it is. Healing is to have a relationship with God, our Father. To be children of God and to be brought along from darkness to light. And that is a process. Healing must be complete. Does it make any sense to be partially healed? You know how the doctor always tells you when you have antibiotics, take them all, right? Because you'll get better after two or three days of antibiotics, sometimes after one day of antibiotics, but you should do all seven. Because if you don't, there's a chance that there will be bacteria that are resistant to the, the antibiotic, partially resistant, and you give them a reprieve, and then the infection comes back even worse. So there is a healing, and a reaction to the healing, which is to obey the doctor and continue taking the antibiotics, and then you're completely healed of that disease that you had. So healing is to have a relationship with God. It's very, very important to understand this. Very few people understand this. People think of Christianity in very legal ways, even among the Orthodox. Of course, we have whole branches of people that call themselves Christian, believe in Christ in some way, but think in a completely legalistic way about salvation, as if salvation is somehow a change of status. It's not a change of status. It's a change of your being. It's a change of who you are. It's a healing of who you are. Nobody wants to go to the doctor and the doctor says, you're fine, you're okay. Well, I'm not fine, I'm not okay, I need healing, I need something, I need treatment. I will obey you, I will do what you tell me. And as I get better, I'll do more of what you tell me and eventually I will be healed. It's very critical to understand this 
difference between the way the world thinks of things and Christianity does. We must understand that healing is this process. It's a beautiful process. Now there are practical applications to this. I think it's very important. I try to do this, and I don't know, perhaps uh, you think I'm successful, perhaps you don't. In almost any sermon that I tell, I want to give you something practical, not just theological. Theological is important. To understand things is important. To understand what leprosy stands for, etc. It's important to understand that they said basically the Jesus prayer, and therefore we say the Jesus prayer. Those things are important. But then you must apply these things to your life. So you must always consider yourself to be like a leper, needing healing. And God is making you heal, healed, whole. And you must always react to your healing. Now how do we do this? I read monastic literature all the time. It's my favorite literature. And there's a certain spirit in monastic literature. They are always making trades with God. They're bartering with God. They're bargaining with God. And this is a good thing to do. They react to God. They say, Lord, one, one monk I remember, he, uh, he um, prayed for the whole world with the Jesus prayer. He made a sort of a bargain with God. He says, God, I don't want to pray for myself. I just want to pray for the world. And since I'm included in the world, you will have mercy on me too. So he would always say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on the whole world. That was his bargain with God. We make bargains all the time. It's very important for you to do this. And we react all the time to God, or we should be, and do it in a practical way. So what do I mean by a practical way? First, let's talk about the gospel very quickly. Just one verse from the gospel for the conception of the Theotokos by St. Anna, which we're celebrating today. And it's in Luke. And the Lord is saying, Therefore take heed how you hear. Whoever has, to him will more be given. Whoever does not have, even that which he seems to have will be taken away. So, if you put this in the context of healing, if you appear to be healed, but you don't react to that healing, then your appearance is not actually healing and it will be taken away from you. So we have to respond to our healing. Very critical. Most of us in this room, I don't have my glasses on so I can't tell for sure, uh, are baptized. Right? There's a few that are not. Now that I look a little more, more carefully, we have some catechumens. Upon your baptism, there must be changes in the way you live. You're a different person now. You have to live differently. You have to live with gratitude to God. You have to change things that you do. You have to consciously make changes because you are reacting to your healing. What does that mean? Perhaps uh, you drink too much. Well, you should stop drinking so much after you're baptized. Before, if possible. Perhaps you're addicted to video games. Well, that's not a very good thing for a Christian to be addicted to. You think you're really going to say the Jesus prayer while you're playing video games and shooting people in the head, stuff like that? You make changes in your life based upon God's intervention in your life. This is very, very important. If you're baptized and you don't change the intensity of your life, then your apparent healing may not be a healing and probably won't be a healing. It's very, very critically important to understand this. Let's give an example, a practical example, of drug addiction. I've known many drug addicts. I've known people who no longer were taking drugs and they were still drug addicts. They were drug addicts because they hadn't changed the way they think, they hadn't changed their priorities, they hadn't changed the way they look at things, they hadn't changed the sort of self-interest that almost every drug addict has. They certainly have self-interest when they're addicted to drugs. Everybody does. But generally, there's a personality warpage that happens when a person becomes addicted to drugs. And you really know a person is healed of that addiction, not when they're not taking the drug anymore, but when they think outwardly about others and not about themselves. So their first healing is their body and their mind is 
addicted to the craving for the drug. The second healing is where they are transformed. And of course, that's a process. So a drug addict who is redeemed by God, delivered from his drug addiction, he should react to this redemption. What should he do? Well, one thing would be not to judge other people who are drug addicts. The other thing is to pray for people who are drug addicts or get involved in their care in some way. Uh, to recognize that because they had a serious weakness that they could not control, that other people do too. To have more empathy and love for other people. That's a reaction to the healing. And if you do that, then you're becoming like Christ. Not just a person who no longer takes a drug. That doesn't save you to not take a drug. What saves you is to be transformed. And you can become transformed if you have gratitude that you've been delivered from your addiction. Of course, drug addiction could be a metaphor for all kinds of other addictions that we have. Make bargains with God. Trade with God. The great canon talks about being a great trader. We should. We should trade. So, for instance, I was reading a, a monastic literature, and uh, the abbess was talking about that someone had some difficulty. So she decided that she would not drink water until three in the afternoon, as uh, on Mondays, to offer for, uh, as a, as a uh, sacrifice for this person. So she would exercise self-control and say, God, I'm exercising self-control with your help. I'm able to do this. Glory be to God that I can, but my sister here cannot. She has this difficulty. So would you help her, please? This is completely Christian. Now, we, we don't make this into some sort of legalistic thing where it's tit for tat, or uh, what's the word that we're hearing a lot? Prid quo quo. I can't say that word correctly. And um, most people don't understand it anyway because they use it for everything. But this is, it's not that. It is where you say, God, you've helped me. So I want to help somebody else. So I, I won't drink any water until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Or I will fast more on Monday. Or I will pray an akathist for someone that isn't praying themselves. This is very dear to God when he sees us making this kind of reaction to our healing. Very critically important. There's other things that you could be doing. Someone, if you're sick and you're delivered from your sickness, you should have more compassion for people who are sick. Pray for people who are sick. I'll give you a personal example. Perhaps you might think it doesn't fit in, but I'll tell you it fits in perfectly. It fits in absolutely perfectly. We should give thanks to God for everything. Everything. Including my son Daniel dying. When he died, I made lots of changes in my life. Because of his death. I offered to God things because of his death. There's been healing in my life because of his death. Of course, I pray for him every day, but it's much more than that. I pray for many people every day. I, I just came back from Africa because my son died. I can't exactly explain to you why, but absolutely, I would never have gone to Africa and gotten so involved in ministry in Africa if my son had not died. It is part of my bargain with God. Make these bargains. Don't just live your life going day to day, doing what you do, making coffee in the morning, and, and um, going to work, and getting the dry cleaning on the way home, and watching your favorite television show at night, and all those sorts of things. Don't just live your life like that. That's, that's lifeless. There is no life in that. You must react to God and to Him daily healing you. You must feel this resonating in your soul. And there must be this compulsion within you. Not that you are required. Not that it is a must, in, but it's something that you have to do inside you. That's not where you're required as, as a slave is required. It's where your inner disposition determines how you live. We must be changing our inner disposition. God is helping us to change our inner disposition. This is what salvation is. It's becoming a different person. And as we become this different person, we must react to it. We are too indifferent about this as people. 
That's why churches can be just more abundant in some ways. People live their lives sort of in a, in a bubble, not aware of everyone else. You must be very much aware of the suffering of others, the needs of others. You must always kind of see their need as something that you had, whether or not it was exactly what, they, what your problem was. Maybe you never had a problem with drug addiction or adultery or having had an abortion or, or something like that. But you can see your weakness in their weakness and you can think and react to God having healed you of a certain weakness. Then you give forth to others. That's what this Samaritan was doing. He was coming back to God to give thanks to him. You think he just went back and thanked him for his healing and said, okay, see you later, thank you very much, and went on to his life? Don't you think that he became a disciple? Don't you think that he wanted to follow Christ and then change the way he lived? I guarantee that's what happened. Otherwise, he wouldn't be pointed out as an example because the Lord said, your faith has made you whole. Faith is not this sort of discrete thing where we say you believe a certain thing and you're good. No, we believe a certain thing and we're still bad and we start to live according to that certain thing and we become good. That's what faith is, to react to God. This is very critically important. So we're coming up on nativity. And of course, nativity is the celebration of the incarnation. And there's so much stuff around it. I just hate all that stuff. When I was a kid, I hated Christmas. Can you believe this? As a kid, I hated Christmas. I hated it. I hated it. I became an Orthodox Christian, and I love it now. My poor family doesn't know what to do with me. I don't want anything to do with trees and everything else. But the reason I love it so much is because I see my healing in front of me. I see my Savior saying, I know you've got problems, Seraphim. I'm going to help you with those things. And the help is not just that there's a thing that I don't want to do or a thing that I do want to do and, I, and I, God helps me with that. But the help is, is much more profound than that. The help is the reshaping of my heart so that there's no longer darkness in it and, and coldness in it and hardness in it. And my heart seems to be opening up. And as it opens up, then I care more about other people. And that is that reaction to healing. You must do this. Increase your intensity in your life as we come now upon the nativity of our Savior. Recognize that he offers you healing of your leprosy, of your sin, of, your, of the death that reigns in you. Weakly now, but it still is there. Recognize this and then give yourself out to others. Change the way you live because of it. Everybody has different things. Certainly prayer must be a foundation, but there's other things too. You must do this if you are to really be a Christian. May God help us to continue in our healing, to become changed. God bless you. God help you in all things. Amen.